No, uh, I, yeah. Let's go. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, we we stopped in the morning um, uh, at some point. Say so. Uh, in particular, uh, I wanted to explain you something about point masses. Uh, so what one might say, I'm now making a small point about point masses, and uh, the reason. Why that's uh, interesting is that point masses basically um, can often be used to model non-rotating black holes. Yeah. So point masses are good approximations for non-rotating black holes, at least in, in some limits, say. So one example where this works very well is in the post-Newtonian approximation. Uh, you've learned a lot about that in the last week. Um, and usually uh, what people there start with is uh, you start with two point masses, which somehow uh, orbit around each other, right? So this could be space-time diagram. Uh, and where well, the two point masses follow geodesics and orbit around each other along a kind of spiral. Um, <coughs> now, here, uh, that would be the tangential to the geodesics, the four velocity, right? Um, and uh, you parameterize the points on the geodesics maybe like this, like x mu, as a function of some parameter sigma. Um, and uh, the action that belongs to that can be written as say uh, an integral over the proper time tau, or when you go to a generic word line parameter sigma of tau, when you do a generic reparameterization of the word line, you get the following. Right? Um, where that for velocity u is now here defined with respect to this generic parameter sigma, uh, not using the proper time. <clears throat> yeah, so that's usually what you do in post-Newtonian theory, right? You have two point masses and you use them as an approximation for two black holes. Uh, you could also use very well point masses when you have a fixed space-time and you want to study the motion of some object in that space-time, it's often a good idea to approximate that by a point particle, by a point mass, right? Uh, and then uh, the expectation, of course, would be that this action as the equation of motion, you just get the geodesic equation of motion. Um, that's um, straightforward to check. So. If you want to get the equations of motion, what you have to do is you vary that action and set the result to zero. Uh, and here, what you get then is the following. 
So you get that some covariant derivative of the following quantity is zero, namely of m mass times u mu divided by uh, the square root that is over here. Now, that looks a little bit ugly, but uh, in fact, uh, one recognizes that this term here is just basically the derivative of the Lagrangian that's over there with respect to the four velocity. So if you call that thing here the Lagrangian L, okay, well, maybe a little more, maybe everything, including this, uh, the sign maybe. Okay, let's put a minus here. Right? So that's uh, the, La the Lagrangian. Then the quantity that's here is just the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to this four velocity. So that's the momentum of the point mass. So what we find is simply that the momentum of the point mass is parallel transported along the world line. And that's basically the definition of a geodesic. Um, OK. Um, so let's write that down. So we found here just the geodesic equation. <coughs> And uh, this guy here is the four momentum, or we might say the canonical four momentum. <clears throat> okay. Uh, good. So now, uh, what one often does in classical mechanics now, uh, if one has a definition of a canonical momentum, is one could try to find a, an actual canonical theory, uh, a canonical version uh, of that description here. Not in terms of a Lagrangian, but in terms of a Hamiltonian. Um, but here, this is somehow a little bit more complicated. So let me explain why. So the naive thing that one would want to do if one wants to arrive at a Hamiltonian would be to do a Legendre transformation. <clears throat> but now there's something strange happening. So the Lagrangian, actually, one can see that quite straightforwardly. If you multiply thing here, velocity again, basically you have here some in, in the denominator, sorry, u squared, uh, in the numerator root of that here. Um, so essentially, when you contract this thing with the four velocity, you get the Lagrangian back. Right. So, if you compute p mu times u mu, you just get the Lagrangian. But that's weird because the Hamiltonian usually is defined as p mu times. Uh, so this would normally be x dot or q dot. Right. So this is x dot essentially. If uh, we say dot is a derivative with respect to sigma, minus uh, the Lagrangian, right? But if you take this thing minus that thing, we basically get zero. So the Hamiltonian seems to be zero. That's a bit weird, right? This would mean there's no dynamics. But uh, there's one very subtle point here, namely, um, that in order to do a Legendre transformation, you need to have a one-to-one -one map mapping between velocities and momenta. And you don't have that here. Because, well, whoop, 
So if you map a four velocity into a momentum, you somehow lose something. Or in other words, that map is not invertible. So clearly, you can map from here to here, because that's just this equation here. The momentum is g given by this expression. So if you know the four velocity, you, uh, you know the momentum. But you cannot invert that, because uh, the momentum fulfills a constraint. namely this one. Yeah? So if you, if you square this expression here, here you have uh, the four velocity divided by its norm. If you square that, uh, you just get minus one. And then you have m square, which remains. So if you square the four velocity, you get minus one. Yeah? So that means basically that here all the components of this four velocity are unconstrained because we haven't normalized it. Uh, but the momentum actually uh, has a fixed length, which is given by the constant mass. Um, now, uh, there's a trick in order to still get a Hamiltonian. And um, the trick is that whenever you have this kind of situation, when you cannot invert this Legendre map, then you take all the constraints that come out and you add them to the action uh, using Lagrange multipliers. So what we do now is we need to add this constraint, this one here, um, to the action. With a Lagrange multiplier. So that would look like the following. So the action for the point mass after a Legendre transformation now looks like the following. I would just uh, write it down and claim that that's the result. And then we can check that the equations of motion are still the same, namely that you still get the geodesic equation. So the action now looks like the following. You have p mu times u mu. That's the usual term that you have in Hamilton's uh, variational principle. Uh, and here, normally, now you have minus the Hamiltonian. But instead, what we write there is minus a Lagrange multiplier times uh, this constraint here. So g mu nu, p mu, p nu plus m square. So that's our new action now. Um, and this Lagrange, this here, yeah, that's also a function of, of sigma. And that's a Lagrange multiplier. Um, or you might might also want to call it uh, a world line metric. Uh, so the reason why I call it like that is uh, because the analogy to string theory is. So in string theory, uh, you often also start from a so-called number go-to action, which is analogous to this here. And then you do a kind of, uh, you can reformulate it in a so-called Poyakov form, uh, which more looks like this. Uh, and there you have a quantity which is called, I think, the world sheet metric, um, which is then analogous to this Lagrange multiplier here. Um, so in, yeah, in some sense, uh, this is, this lambda here kind of encodes the relation between this sigma here 
uh, and maybe the coordinate time, for example. So uh, in this sense, it's uh, the metric of a word line. It uh, relates, uh, it, it tells you what this parameter here actually means, the sigma. Um, and also, if you count degrees of freedom, you see that everything works out, namely uh, in the sense that uh, this four velocity here has four independent components. The momentum only has three independent components due to this constraint here. But then we basically add a fourth component, which is given by the Lagrange multiplier. So in the end, also in this action, you have four independent components, and they correspond to the four components of the four velocity. Uh, OK, so that's that said. Uh, now let's check uh, that it gives the same equations of motion. Yeah? The, yes, so did I understand right? You asked about that? Yes, uh, that's right. But um, then uh, you have to put a tau here. Yeah. So what, what we did here is we defined u in a slightly different way than usual. Maybe one should also use a different symbol for that. But yeah, so here actually it has a sigma. Otherwise, also here you would have, you, you should write a 1 for, for this guy here, right? But um, yeah, so the, the reason why we do that is um, when, when you work with a generic world line parameter, uh, you, you still have the freedom to choose it in a convenient way in the, in the end. Um, yeah. And we will actually do this uh, in the first example that we look at. Uh, yeah. Are there more questions to this construction so far? Otherwise, I will now show you that the equations of motion are still the same. So yeah, this may look a bit strange and, and weird, but uh, it's actually quite quite useful to, uh, sometimes to work with this kind of action. Yeah, OK. Um, so let's see what the equations of motion look like. Um, First of all, we we get, of course, this constraint. If we vary with respect to lambda, we just get the constraint. So we get p square equal to minus m square, essentially, a mass shell constraint. Then uh, if we vary with respect to p, uh, we get u equals to, no, u minus lambda p basically is 0, and a factor of 2, because we have two p's here. So we would get u mu equal to 2 times lambda times p mu. This would be one equation of motion. And uh, if we vary with respect to the world line coordinate, x, right, so we flip it over here, then basically we have a derivative uh, acting on, on p. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that because you also have a dependence here. Uh, the metric is taken at the location of the, of the particle on the world line, so you also get derivatives of the metric in there, but they just combine in such a way that the equations of motion in the end are covariant, right? You start with a covariant action. If you vary that, you need the equation of motion need to be covariant. And uh, from varying the position, you do get the time derivative of p, and that has to be the covariant one in the end. So you get d p mu d sigma equal zero. And that's just the geodesic equation again. Um, if you now would combine these two equations, you could solve also for lambda, right? Uh, to get it out of the game again. And you will find it's 1 over 2m. Oops, sorry. 
times the norm of uh, the four velocity, basically. Yeah, so you really see that lambda really uh, what it encodes is the norm of the four velocity, which often is one, but uh, you could choose it to be different here. It's a it's a gauge choice, uh, and if you combine this with that, you just get that p mu is equal to m times u mu divided by the norm of the four velocity. Right, so that's basically what we had before: the geodesic equation and uh, the formula for p mu. Um, what's interesting about that picture here is that basically the whole dynamics is encoded in the Marshall constraint. So usually all of this would be the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian is just the Marshall constraint here, and it encodes all the dynamics of the point mass. So Marshall, I'm writing it down again, because it's quite important. That one, that's the Marshall constraint, and that one really encodes the dynamics. <clears throat> yeah. And at the same time, it also takes the place of the Hamiltonian in the action principle. <clears throat> OK, so that's nice already. What's even more important often is um, that this action is linear in the inverse metric. Um, and that can often have computer advantages. You do post or, uh, or something like that. Whereas here, you have a square root of the metric, which is quite ugly. So if you do a perturbative expansion in the metric, then here you have an infinite series of inter possible interaction terms. So if you think about it in terms of Feynman diagrams, then it basically means uh, that the, the, the world line basically can interact with one graviton, with two, with three, with four, with an infinite number of gravitons when you expand uh, the square root, because you always generate new uh, terms uh, in the metric. Uh, from, well, or you, yeah, you always generate higher order interactions from square root here. Um, but say if you use basically the inverse metric as your graviton, then you would just have one interaction. And that's, uh, that's all. So um, usually uh, you cannot exactly do that, but uh, you just see that this can have, uh, can have the potential to simplify calculations. Yeah, because the, the interaction of the test body with the metric is in some sense uh, linear now. <clears throat> okay. So yeah, these are a few nice uh, properties of this action. Um, now uh, we we want to see want to see all this a little. Bit. Uh, apply it to the case of test bodies, right? Um, so as I said in, in the first lecture, what we want to do in the end is uh, to combine uh, post-Newtonian results uh, with results for test bodies, uh, because f for test bodies, basically, you can let them orbit in a fixed metric, and you can also let them orbit in a strong field regime. So by combining the weak field slow motion approximation with that of a test body, which can move in strong gravitational fields and which can move arbitrarily fast, uh, you can you have some hope to improve uh, your model for the dynamics of binary black holes. So that that's overall the goal. Um, so let's look at this example of a test mass. Yeah. 
in a very simple metric, namely the Schwarzschild metric, so a non-rotating black hole. Uh, yes, and this test body sh uh, should have mass mu now. So I basically I rename this m here with a mu. Uh, the uh, the reason will be come apparent uh, a little later, but let's just say the test mass has a mass mu, and uh, the Schwarzschild metric has a mass big M. like this. So the case that we look at now is basically we have some big black hole here and uh, some very small test mass orbiting around that. <coughs> so uh, what else do we need? Yes, we need the coordinates. And since we work with a Schwarzschild metric, let's call them T, R, theta, and phi, like this. And yeah, since uh, the space-time overall is rotation symmetric, um, and as we'll see later, we have angular momentum, we can actually restrict our attention to the um, to the equatorial plane. So we can also assume that theta is equal to pi half. Yeah. So then we are in the equatorial plane of uh, Schwarzschild. <coughs> now, uh, yeah, now it, it's kind of useful to assume now that we well, well we that we fix the the gauge for this world line parameter sigma to be the coordinate time Um, uh, the, the, the reason is that usually when you want to look at gravitational waves, uh, then basically uh, you compute all the quantities like the frequency with which uh, the particle is orbiting or the phase, you compute them as a function of the coordinate time and not of the proper time like you do in post-Newtonian calculations. So in order to make the con an easier connection to post-Newtonian calculations, uh, we fix this gauge like this. And we don't fix sigma to be the uh, proper time, in particular. <clears throat> now, that basically means that the zero component of a four velocity, which is dt by d sigma, that's just one, right? Uh, and hence, in the action here, this contraction between um, four momentum and four velocity looks like the following. So just remember this is something like x dot mu, uh, right? And now we use this, and we use the definition of the coordinates. And we just write out uh, th this contraction here according to the summation rule of Einstein and some overall components. And then we get that this is PR times R dot plus P phi times phi dot and P naught times U naught, but U naught is just one, right? So that's what we get. <clears throat> Good. Uh, now we can also use uh, the Marshall constraint to get rid of one of the components of the four momentum. And let's maybe eliminate this P naught here, which is uh, something like the energy of the particle. So 
it's uh, somehow it must be related to the Hamiltonian. <coughs> Okay, so now next step would be we solve actually the Marshall constraint, we make use of it. And we solve it for the P0 component, and let's call minus P0, let's call it H, because we kind of anticipate that it would be the Hamiltonian, right? P0 is something like the energy of the particle. So we want to get that from this constraint. Um, G is the Schwarzschild metric, so let's uh, recall how the line element looks like. That's G mu nu, dx mu, dx nu, right? That's just the definition of the line element. And in Schwarzschild coordinates for a non-rotating black hole, it reads like this, you have uh, this thing called A, which I define as 1 minus 2m divided by r, small r. <coughs> A, so that's basically in the time-time component of the metric. Then you have the r square part, which is uh, 1 over A, and then you kind of have a flat uh, uh, surface uh, of a sphere, so to say, just the normal metric of the surface of a sphere, as in flat space-time, which looks like this. And, uh, yeah, and since we um, look at the equatorial plane only, we, we have zero for that and uh, one for this thing here, the sine of theta square. Uh, good. So now we plug that into here and then solve for the Hamiltonian, for the energy. <clears throat> okay. S yeah, so let's write down this equation a bit more explicitly. So that would now be 1 over A, right? So we have to take the inverse metric here. That means basically you uh, invert all the coefficients in the metric because it's a diagonal metric. You can simply get the inverse metric. And the time-time component would be just basically 1 over A times Hamiltonian square with a minus. Then you have, so here we have uh, A times PR square, the radial momentum square. And then, uh, so then this part here, the P phi part. And let me maybe call P phi the angular momentum, right? So it's the momentum uh, of the motion in the theta direction. So that should be something like uh, angular momentum. So that's what we what we get explicitly. So that's now the Marshall constraint for a test body in Schwarzschild spacetime. <laughs> now, 
Now it's simple to solve that for H for the Hamiltonian. Get is it's the square root of A times mu square plus A P R square plus L square divided by R square. <coughs> So that's that's it. So in the end, it was just some algebra, right? Yeah. That. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, so this is the angular. Momentum, right? So, yep. So in the end, uh, as a rule of thumb, all you have to do is you take a Marshall constraint, you solve for the energy, and that basically gives you the Hamiltonian of the test body. <clears throat> now. Uh, let's write down the action, how it looks. So initially it looked like that. Now when we insert a solution to the Marshall constraint, this last part here will be identically zero, right? We explicitly solve the constraint in this way. This is a solution to the constraint equation. And once we insert that into the action, this last part here will be zero. And all that we have left is the part in the front. Uh, and this is just this. So let's write that down. So the action that we have now is the new point mass action for point mass in Schwarzschild space time. is uh, PR times R dot plus uh, L times phi dot minus the Hamiltonian. Now this looks quite nice. And uh, if we now calculate the equations of motion, right? So if we now vary this action, then we would hope, we would expect that we get Hamilton's equations. And yeah, that's, that's indeed the case. So if we vary with respect to PR, say, then we get R dot equal to derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to PR. Like this. Uh, similarly, uh, when we vary with respect to PR, we get an R dot. Uh, yeah. Or well, let me write it a bit more uh, explicitly. Like this. Uh, so if we then vary with respect to, to R, we get a P dot, PR dot. And that's equal to minus the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the radial coordinate. Uh, and then we can play the same game for the other uh, coordinate and the other momentum. So here we would get d phi, the derivative of a phase, which is omega, basically, is equal to the h by the L and uh, the derivative of the angular momentum with respect to time is minus dH by d phi. Yeah, and since we started with a metric, which is um, spherically symmetric, uh, it's maybe not surprising that the Hamiltonian doesn't depend on the angular coordinate phi. So this thing here is just zero. So we have angular momentum conservation, right? <clears throat> uh, 
L is just constant. Um, now, this will of course change uh, once we allow the particle, uh, the test mass to radiate gravitational waves, for example. Then uh, the, uh, well, there will be angular momentum loss in the form of gravitational waves, also energy loss, and things will be different. But here, uh, we've basically uh, treated the system as really in the exact test body limit, where the mass is so small uh, that the radiation can be neglected. <coughs> Okay, so as an exercise, what you could try to do is uh, you can show that Kepler's law, so omega square times r to the power of three equals m in our geometrized units is still uh, valid here. Um, now, of course, we know that this should hold in the Newtonian limit, but here, actually, uh, we are treating in GR, right? So the, the thing is that for this uh, special case, Schwarzschild, where R is the special Schwarzschild coordinate, uh, this equation does still hold. You could, of course, rewrite uh, Schwarzschild geometry in different coordinates with a different radial coordinate, and then this wouldn't hold in exactly the same way. But somehow for this gauge choice, uh, Kepler's law still holds uh, as in Newton's gravity. Uh, yes, yes, right, uh, sorry, yes, for circular orbits. Thanks, yes. So yeah, maybe the exercise was one step too early <laughs> because uh, now uh, we want to specialize that thing to circular orbits uh, and look at the, basically at the effective radial potential, which is usually derived in a slightly different way in textbooks. Um, but uh, since we want to make use of this picture with the Marshall constraints later on, um, this derivation here is a bit more, well, it, it fits a bit better into this uh, line of lectures. Um, so let's uh, derive uh, that the usual picture with the uh, radial potential uh, in a bit different way now. <laughs> and specialize uh, the Hamiltonian to circular orbits and then look at uh, circular motion and how you can understand it. So let's look at circular orbits. Now that uh, just means here that we set the radial momentum, the momentum in the radial direction to zero, um, and hold the radial coordinate constant. Yeah, <coughs> good. That's a circular orbit. Now, what we would get then, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. S so, if PR is zero, then basically that means that for circular orbits, we are looking at an extremum of the Hamiltonian in the radial direction. Right? So, PR is zero. And that's equal to dh by dr. So we have to find a minimum of the Hamiltonian in the radial direction, and this gives us a circular orbit. So that's a very, very nice energetic picture, right? We want to be in the minimum of the energy. Um, equivalently with h square. <coughs> Say, as long as h is not exactly zero, these two conditions here would be the same. 
Ja? Ja? Äh, ja. Ja, ja uh, in principle, yes, uh, but some things that you don't see is, for instance, that when you take the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to L, that you get omega also. This is a bit more difficult to see, for example. Uh, plus, uh, the derivation is a little... I always find it a bit weird, because often what you then write is you write an equation for R square, and then... Uh, you you separate it somehow in this weird way, right? Uh, and then you call that thing uh, radial potential. This is so that's the derivation in Mr. Thorn Wheeler, for example. I think is it like that? Uh, yes, right. Uh, yeah, um, but in the, in the standard way, I think you only get a potential uh, that's valid for circular orbits that I'm quite quite sure about. Yeah. So that, that action means that you want to set the integral in, in the Lagrangian. Yeah. Uh -huh. But then, since we have a, a problem to identify, so if you are working in a Lagrangian formula or in a Hamiltonian formula, because the equation that you write, they seem to be in a Hamiltonian formula. Yeah. Uh, what? what? So your, your variables are not R and R dot, I mean Q and Q dot. Your variables are here in Q and P. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, yes, right. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, um, but, so in, in classical mechanics, you, you would, well, but, uh, I, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so you you vary this action independently with respect to momenta and uh, the coordinates. Whereas when this is a standard Lagrangian, you would just vary the coordinates. Okay. In this case, you write the Lagrangian in this guy. You write the Hamiltonian in this guy. You write the Lagrangian, and then you take the Hamiltonian, basically, because you, you know already what is the Hamiltonian, and then you write down the Hamiltonian equation. Well, I mean, uh, we we started with an action principle, and then we just did a calculation to arrive here. It's it's not that we constructed this Lagrangian out of nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's more the other way around. We compute the Lagrangian, and then we see uh, that we get Hamilton's equations. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but what what do you mean by standard construction? Yeah, but so you need to show that from somewhere, right? You need you need to show that somehow. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, that's right. But uh, in in the beginning, I mean, I was showing you that uh, in relativistic case, uh, the definition of a Hamiltonian is a bit more subtle in general, right? I mean, if you just want to define the Hamiltonian in a covariant way, uh, you you get the weird result that it's zero, for example. So it's a little more subtle here. It's only when we basically go back to a 3 plus 1 picture. So when we make a gauge fixing for the time, 
and we explicitly break uh, the space-time symmetry, then we get back to the normal picture. But it really follows out of this maybe weird-looking action with a Marshall constraint. Um, Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, so the P, the Hamiltonian is the conjugate uh, somehow to, to U naught. Yes. Yeah. And then we make a convenient gauge fixing and then we just uh, land over there. Yeah. Okay, I mean, okay, I can try to look up a little bit more how this compares to the standard approach in the Misner Thorn Wheeler, but uh, um, this, in principle, this should be a bit more generic, I think. <coughs> okay, uh, good. So, okay, now. Um, we want to look at circular orbits, and that means basically uh, we want to be in an extremum of the Hamiltonian. Um, and the Hamiltonian here is, well, just given by the following equation, 1 minus 2m divided by r times mu square plus l square divided by r square. All right, and yeah. So that's uh, usually called the radial potential in some textbooks. Um, and the, the reason is the following. Namely, now when we plot that thing, I uh, need a bit more space over here, I think. Then it looks like the following. So we basically see here uh, that this term looks like the Newtonian potential, basically. Right? So this term here just describes the gravitational attraction and, and this term here is uh, the angular momentum barrier whoops <clears throat> okay, and let me put that a bit in quotation mark because this term here, the angular momentum barrier, comes really from the Newtonian case. <clears throat> so let's try to figure out how this would look like. So just in the Newtonian case, usually you start with some flat thing at infinity, then the gravitational uh, attraction basically makes the potential go down. But then the angular momentum barrier, since it's 1 over r square compared to a 1 over r term, it will eventually win, and the potential goes back up again to infinity. So that's the angular momentum barrier, right? So the particle can never get uh, as close as it wants to the central object. Uh, because uh, at least when it has a non-zero angular momentum, because that term will always pre prevent that. <clears throat> okay, uh, and the circular orbit would sit here, right, in the minimum. There you have the circular orbit. Now, <clears throat> in the relativistic case, the things are a bit different, because uh, the, uh, the potential is factorized in this way. Yeah, so Eventually, this term will become big, yes, but then 1 minus 2m divided by r. Uh, when r gets close to m, then this term here will uh, get smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually it will become zero even, and negative beyond that. 
So this term here basically then pulls down the curve again. So uh, overall, you would expect that you have a similar behavior of the curve. But then eventually, oops, that's not so good. Eventually, the curve has to go down again. And uh, it has to pass 0 at r equal to m. Right? <clears throat> and uh, the height of this point here is basically given by the angular momentum, how big this term here is. So if the angular momentum would be a bit smaller, then the curve that you would get would more look like would more look like this. Oops. And if it's yet even smaller, it would maybe look more like this. And what? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, formally uh, there is, I mean, but of course the, the thing is once the Hamiltonian square becomes negative, there's something fundamentally wrong, right? <laughs> so yeah, formally uh, h square here becomes negative, but uh, that's a regime where the Hamiltonian is not describing the physics anymore. Yeah, and of course, you, you know, uh, I think that at 2m you have the event horizon. So you cannot describe the particle motion um, in terms of the coordinate time at infinity anymore. That's uh, what goes wrong. Um, OK. But now the, the point is, um, you see here that in relativity, there, there's a new feature. right? So the angular momentum barrier is not there anymore. But instead, uh, you have something which, uh, in the misnasson Rila book, it's called the pit in the potential. This is this thing here, basically where you have a kind of pit where the particle can fall in and not get out anymore. So this is uh, the pit in the potential. <clears throat> um, and uh, yeah, what I've tried to depict here is basically a curve where the angular momentum goes down. So that's moving in that direction here. This basically describes what happens when the angular momentum L goes down. And of course, this will happen in a realistic scenario where you actually have gravitational wave emission, and uh, the gravitational waves are carrying away angular momentum. So during the in-spiral, this will actually happen. That basically this thing here adiabatically moves down. <coughs> due to the emission of gravitational waves. And what, what happens in the end? Well, so here's the circular orbit. The circular orbit now slowly moves more and more inwards due to the same mechanism. Uh, it's a bit hard to see now. Um, and in the end, uh, basically, this maximum and this minimum would become one point. So you form a saddle point. So at some point, the curve will look like this. And the minimum, where you have a stable circular orbit, and this maximum, where you have an unstable circular orbit, they will just merge into a saddle point. Uh, and that thing uh, is called the, how did I call it here? The innermost stable circular orbit. <clears throat> right? Uh, good. So that's uh, that picture of what you can learn from the Hamiltonian on the circular orbits. Uh, yeah, so let me write that down a little bit so that you can maybe digest it, or maybe you know it already, but 
Yeah, so the minimum and the maximum of that potential basically move together. during the in-spiral. <clears throat> and that means uh, that, well, they basically form a saddle point here. So you don't have a minimum of the potential anymore. Um, that means you don't have a stable circular orbit anymore. And, well, this will be true during an in-spiral once you get to the point r equal to 6m for this idealized case of a small mass uh, orbiting in Schwarzschild spacetime. <clears throat> and that's basically uh, the point um, which defines where the motion uh, transits from a small adiabatic in-spiral to the so-called plunge. Yeah. So now, one says that this mass mu now plunges into the black hole. <clears throat> so in the end, uh, not the angular momentum barrier wins, but in uh, GR, basically, gravity wins in the end. Right? So um, let me uh, repeat that a little bit more. So what we, what we found here is that uh, during the in-spiral, uh, which happens basically adiabatically, and you always have a quasi-stable circular orbit, which just slowly moves inwards, where the conservative motion itself becomes unstable. Um, and then basically you have a rapid plunge of the small black hole into the big black hole, which is not driven primarily by the radiation due to gravitational waves, but it's really driven by the fact that the motion becomes unstable. You don't have a minimum of the potential anymore. And that's kind of defines in this scenario where the plunge begins and the in spiral ends. Okay, <clears throat> now, good. So, uh, this is actually one strong gravity effect that you, we would like to have in uh, the waveform model in the end. And it's not easy to describe that or impossible to get it right just from post-Newtonian theory. But uh, you can hope that when you combine uh, this kind of Hamiltonian, or this, this one here, that describes the test body motion, which has this feature of the last stable orbit and which correctly describes the plunge dynamics. When you combine that with post-Newtonian results, uh, you have a hope to describe the kind of uh, strong field features correctly, where they uh, basically, whether the plunge is not driven by radiation reaction, but by an instability of the Hamiltonian itself. <clears throat> okay, now uh, let me briefly also mention another strong gravity effect that's encoded in the Hamiltonian, which we also want to have in our form model in the end. <clears throat> and uh, that's the so called light ring. <laughs> so another strong gravity uh, 
uh, feature, let's say, is the so-called light ring. Um, now, that's uh, an unstable photon orbit. Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, instead of photons, you could also think of a uh, ultra relativistic particle where the rest mass is basically negligible. Um, now, let's first draw a picture of that because uh, then it's easy to understand what that is and why that should exist. So, you could imagine uh, that you send a photon, so a massless particle, uh, along a trajectory along the black hole, and if you tune it just right, then the photon uh, will move on a circle. Right? That must be possible because at the event horizon, basically, only photons which move radially out will escape. So if you move somewhere like here, then uh, maybe a photon moving in that direction will inevitably fall in. Right? So it has to move a lot in the radial direction to escape. But then at some point, gravity is weak enough so that you can have a stable orbit uh, in this tangential direction. And that's basically this photon orbit. Um, but it has to be unstable, because when you move a little bit more in, then gravity is again too strong, and the photon will fall into the black hole. While uh, when you move a little bit too far out, you just have a scattering of light on the black hole, like this. Right? So that orbit has to be unstable. If you perturb it a little bit, uh, the photon will escape either to infinity or into the black hole. <clears throat> okay, so that thing here is then the light ring. Uh, actually, it's a whole sphere, right? But say we look at the orbit uh, at the equatorial plane, then it's uh, it's a ring. <clears throat> Mm. Good. Uh, so we can also easily compute where that is. So let's again take our h square and look for a circular orbit. But um, in order to describe photons, we can now easily take the limit uh, of the mass goes to zero. That's more difficult to do uh, when you use a normal Lagrangian, of course, because that's proportional to the mass, and then basically you just get zero for the Lagrangian. But here, in this form of the action, you can easily take the limit uh, where the mass goes to zero. And what you get then is just A, this potential A, which was 1 minus 2m divided by r, times L squared divided by r squared. So that's the Hamiltonian square. Then uh, you can set the derivative of that to zero, right? And with mu set to zero also. Uh, and that gives you zero equals, well, first we have an a prime times l squared divided by r squared. And then we have the derivative of this term here which is minus 2L squared divided by R to the power of 3 times A again. Uh, so the prime here denotes a radial derivative. Uh, okay, uh, and that basically means that 2 times A is equal to R times A prime. Or if we now insert A from here, we basically get 2 times 1 minus 2m divided by r equals 2m divided by r. Yeah. Uh, good. And if we solve that for r, we get r equals to 3m. 
So that's a point somewhere in between of the event horizon and the last stable orbit for massive particles. There you have this kind of light ring. <clears throat> now, why is it interesting? Um, so the reason is uh, that you can also think of gravitational waves as behaving similar to photons, right? They are both massless uh, particles in some sense, at least in a geometric optics limit. Um, so you could also imagine that you have gravitational waves going in circles around a black hole at the light ring. <clears throat> um, and if you, well, if you now think that you somehow have a black hole plunging or, or some other object plunging into the black hole here, uh, and that thing is somehow emitting gravitational waves, so you have here now a massive particle, say, which orbits, and it somehow emits gravitational waves, just like maybe an electron in a synchrotron, then at the light ring you would expect that basically half of the gravitational waves emitted by that guy are falling into the black hole and the other half uh, can ex uh, uh, escape to infinity, right? In the sense that if you're just a little bit inside, uh, then the gravitational wave would fall in, and if you would be a little bit outside, then it can escape to infinity. So <laughs> the point is that once a massive guy reaches the light ring, you would expect that basically half of the gravitational waves that it can emit are falling into the black hole, and the other half can still escape to infinity. <clears throat> I mean, this is very qualitative, right? But it still, it maybe gives you some intuition that something special is also happening when a massive guy uh, is crossing the light ring. <clears throat> So qualitatively, one could say that half of the gravitational waves are falling into the other black hole. In a binary. <coughs> Or, yeah, or in the final black hole. It's maybe a better description. So that means that more or less uh, you can identify that point uh, with a point of maximum gravitational wave amplitude. At least that, uh, that's what one could expect. Yeah? That uh, once the system reaches the light ring, uh, then approximately you have also reached uh, the point of maximum gravitational wave amplitude, because after that point, most of the gravitational waves that are generated are falling into the final black hole or into one of the black holes. <clears throat> uh, just let me remind you how the gravitational wave looks like. So the chirp looks somewhat like this, and here, somewhere, you have a point of maximum amplitude. <clears throat> and uh, it's kind of important to, to model the signal at least up to here before you start to attach uh, some kind of ring down described by black hole perturbation theory. So you, you want to describe the dynamics uh, very well up to the light ring. Yeah, and that's another strong field, very strong gravity feature, because at that point, uh, light goes in circles around the black hole, basically. <clears throat> but uh, this light ring is properly described uh, by this test body Hamiltonian. Yeah, so that's another motivation combine test body uh, results or the result for the test body Hamiltonian uh, with post-Newtonian results and build a waveform model uh, based on that. And uh, 
that's yeah that's what we will try then next time where we actually define a hamiltonian which does that which combines the test body results and the post newtonian results in a very nice and simple way and uh, actually uh, i don't know have you have you seen the say th third post newtonian the 3pn equations of motion and the lagrangian of that in the last lectures <laughs> Lex yeah i mean that was a very nasty big thing right and i will show you that you can actually write it down easily on a blackboard when you do these kind of tricks like combining the results and uh, using some other trick which is called the energy map which i would try to motivate uh, and then you have a very nice and compact way to to write down uh, the dynamics yeah thanks <laughs> Yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't get why half of the gravitational waves at the right ring. Uh, why why half? Sorry, I, I, miss, yeah. I missed that part. Uh, well, that's very hand wavy and qualitative, but uh, the argument is that, uh, okay, let's draw it here. Um, so say, whoops, you have the black hole and you have some now massive particle orbiting around that, and it's emitting gravitational waves similar to an electron emitting synchrotron radiation, then some rays would go like this and some rays would go like that, right? And uh, these rays, all, uh, all of these rays, which are basically a little uh, going inwards with respect to the light ring here, so if this is r equal to 3m, the light ring, then all of these guys will fall in, and these guys can escape to infinity. That's why it's half, because basically this is cutting the cone of emission into two parts, more or less. It doesn't have to be exactly half, but it's, it's more or less half, at least when you look at the picture. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <coughs> I think we can naturally drift into the discussion session involving all of the speakers of today. So if you have a question for any of the speakers. Sorry, perhaps this was already treated in the past week, and I shouldn't be asking this question, but the students should be asking. But uh, can you can you use a similar simple formalism to treat the ring down phase of a gravitational waves? Uh, maybe this was already treated last week. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I'm, probably it was not, but uh, I will come to the ring down later on. So. Oh, great. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Even without spo spoiling, just in anticipation. So, yeah. students, are, is it clear to you what is the ring down? What is the ring down? Lord of the Rings. It is clear, right? It is, it's clear to you. If it's not, it's your time to ask. So uh, there are different ways to actually compute what the ring down would look like, but uh, I, I will do two things. I will treat it first uh, using black hole perturbation theory, or at least give the picture how you can get it from there. Um, but I will also discuss a different picture, which is very closely linked to this light ring. Um, 
so that's a very small spoiler. Um, but yeah, in the morning, uh, all I said about the ring down was basically that uh, in the end, when the two black holes merge, right, you don't have a black hole in equilibrium, but you have a perturbed black hole. And uh, that black hole will have some dynamics and eventually settle down uh, into a stationary black hole. And that's the, the ring down. Um, and yeah, okay, maybe I can spoil a little bit more. <laughs> um, so there so I think there is one, something interesting to mention here that I maybe you will mention this, the relation between the ring down and the no hair theorem. Uh, in, in the sense that why does the, the shaky black hole uh, stop shaking and settles in a, yeah. in a Kerr black hole? That's the no hair theorem. Yeah. Right. The, right. The, 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 the perturbed black hole is hair. You're trying to put hair in the black hole, right? Yeah. And do you agree with that? And then um, the hair, the black hole dances and shakes away the, the yeah, hair? Uh, may, maybe. Uh, although, uh, once you have dynamics, uh, I find it a little weird to talk about no hair theorems. Ah, okay. Um, so, w one of the first no hair theorems was actually also, for example, on scalar charges on a black hole, right? Scalar what? Scalar charge, like the theorem from Hawking, uh, or one of them was assuming that you have an additional hypothetical scalar field, say phi, uh, and the statement then is that uh, the black hole cannot have a non-trivial scalar field. All, uh, all you need to describe a black hole is its electric charge, its mass, and its spin, even when you have additional fields, like such a massless scalar field. But uh, it was shown, and now I forgot by whom, uh, that once uh, you make that scalar field dynamical or you make the boundary conditions on the scalar field dynamical, mm -hmm. you have a, a black hole hair growth, a more dynamical black, black, hole, black, hole, black hole hair growth. Ah. The black hole is starting to, to grow a hair. Wow. It, That's it's also cool. It's uh, <laughs> called the hair growth formula. Uh, like, I don't know, like it's some kind of lotion that you put on a black hole and suddenly <laughs> uh, it's not bold anymore. <laughs> okay. A lot of um, people would be interested in this hair grow thing. Yeah, would they? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, but uh, so a nice physical intuition on the ring down is also that uh, the light ring in some sense is uh, a boundary, um, right? So. As I said, when you are inside the light ring, the gravitational waves almost have to move in the radial direction to get out. When they move in the tangential direction, they will stay within that uh, light ring sphere. Um, so in some sense, the light ring acts as a kind of resonator, just like, like a bell also. So uh, basically, when you have a perturbed black hole, there will be space-time perturbations wobbling around uh, resonantly almost inside the light ring. Uh, just like uh, you have perturbations on a bell when you ring it and they wobble around there. And uh, the light ring fixes basically the frequency of the ring down. Uh, and this is what I, what I will show at some point. Yeah, so the light ring acts uh, uh, like a resonator and uh, you have an analogy to a ringing of a bell from there. Um. Okay, um, I have a question about the, the 3 plus 1 decomposition for, for Sasha. And I want to know if maybe there is a problem to apply this formalism for um, closed uni for um, universe where, where you have closed curves like the, like, like the Gödel universe solution to Einstein field equation. So, uh, so, 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 talk about a closed universe? Uh, no, no. A, a universe with closed curves that may be closed time like curves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, if, so if you have closed time like curves, which is like a, a time machine basically, mm -hmm. then then uh, the initial value problem breaks down, right? So if if, if this is if this is some initial hypersurface, which is what the the, the thing that we call six, and then and then you 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 want to have an initial value problem. And so, for example, you, you, you consider its domain of dependence, what we call d plus before. So these are, these are all the points which, which can be, um, where, where the data can be determined in terms of, of the data on this surface. 
Uh, so the the, the, basically, the technical definition is that these are those points where if, if I have some point and I take any causal curve backward in time like this, then it has to register here so that its data are determined by the surface. But if I, have, if I have a closed time like curve, as we'll imagine, so here we have a closed time like curve. It's, just, it's, okay. it's a closed curve and it's, it's all time like. So then, so then th this has never registered here. This, 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 there is no data on this surface which determine what's happened here. It's a, it's a miracle. Oh. Right? It's, yeah? from, the, from the perspective of the initial value problem, it, it, there's nothing inconsistent with GR. Okay, it's can perfectly it can be perfectly consistent with the Einstein equations. It's simply a miracle. It wasn't it wasn't you couldn't have planned it in terms of an initial value problem. Okay? In some sense, you cannot you you cannot have an algorithm to construct a time machine because you would have to have an algorithm that tells you, yeah, if I if I do this and this and this, then there's a unique prediction for the future, which is there will be a time machine. But but this tells you that that it's having a time machine is not consistent with an initial value problem. Okay, so this, this doesn't mean you cannot have a time machine. It's just you can't build one because you're know, not in an algorithm. Does it make sense? Okay, yes. If there are not enough questions, then the, the, the lecturers, we have, we have to, I mean, you can't leave early. We have, we have to uh, Talk you. pressure you on uh, some more questions. <laughs> yeah, or maybe it was too abstract to, to concretize doubts into questions. Going back to the ring down phase, uh, it's not clear to me why you cannot use, or at least that's what I what I heard, why you cannot use numerical relativity to to model the ring down phase, or or you can. I I I am you, can. you can't. You can. You can. You can. <laughs> can. In fact, that that's so. Th this is this is how you do it. But there are some subtleties. Okay, that I think we'll all, all agree on it. So 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 one. Uh, one question is, do you know what, so you all know what ring down is, that's, that's fantastic. Do you also all know what quasi-normal modes are? I, I'm gonna, I think you probably will explain it, I will have, I'll have a slide about it, but I think we can give a preview. You, you all know what normal modes are, okay? If you have a, a, a classical system that can oscillate, you have, can have characteristic frequencies. But this is when, when the energy is conserved. When the energy is not conserved because you lose energy, then you will, instead of having a, a fixed oscillation of constant amplitude, you will lose energy, and the, the, you have a damped oscillator. So quasi-normal modes is when you lose energy, and so in this case, you, you lose energy either because the waves escape to infinity, or they're falling into the black hole. So you lose energy, you have a, you have a damped oscillator. Okay? And so this is what is called um, quasi-normal modes. You have, you have your solution, whatever, for the strain, whatever quantity you look at as a function of time, is e to the i omega t, whatever, h0. But now, but now this thing is, is complex. It has a real part. It has an imaginary part. And so the imaginary part, it makes it damp. Um, and be basically, because of the uh, no hair theorem, uh, once, so once you know the spin of the black hole, you can compute what these frequencies are. Um, and so, so, so this looks like what... Uh, um, what Jan was, was showing before, so if, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I draw the amplitude here, right, the amplitude is a, is a function like that, and so now here, this will show exponential decrease. All right. So, I can, these frequencies, so there's, there's, um, there's a certain, there's a real part, so this is frequency here, it has a real part, an imaginary part, the real part tells me what's you know, the oscillation frequency, and the imaginary part is basically the damping constant, and once I know the spin of the black hole, I can compute them analytically. 
basically people do that. You can, you can look up the, the res formula. Something. So, so, that, so that's very good to know, to have this analytical information. But, but from the analytical point of view, the problem is that this perturbation theory is linear. So it gives you the frequencies, but it can't tell you the amplitude because it's a linear theory. Okay? So the amplitude you have to compute in an R. All right? Um, it also, because so you know that basically the late time behavior, you will have this clean ring down, but it's very hard to say exactly where does it start. Does it start here or there or there? It starts roughly somewhere around there, but where precisely? This is hard to say. Okay, um, so 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 you you need you need to compute your NR at least until somewhere here, until you have a clean ring down. At some point, it gets difficult with the numerical solution because the amplitude drops exponentially. It's a big numerical simulation. There are all kinds of sources of numerical noise. If your if your signal drops exponentially, at some point the noise is going to be bigger than the signal. If, if I would make a if I would make a logarithmic plot of the amplitude, it would look something like, so I have my in-spiral, there's a peak, then it, it falls exponentially, but eventually I hit the noise. Eventually it looks like whatever, like that, noise. Okay? And so obviously if, I, if I'm interested in continuing the signal even further, then I would have to do it with the analytical value. Because then that's just going to be better. So, so this is kind of what this is kind of what we do in practice. You compute the whole thing with an R, but you but you can compare here with the um, with the analytical analytically known uh, frequency values. If you want to continue further, you could continue further with the analytical values. And if you want to make a model, whatever approach of models it is that that Jan has talked about. Then you basically then, then some other way you would practically do it is you first you would have a model which predicts based on my initial masses and spins what's going to be the final spin, and then once I know the final spin I know what these frequencies are and that in any type of these models that would be one of the basic building block of the formulas that give you your waveform. Do you agree? Yeah. I have a question. About just this comparison that you are going to do, that you claim to do with numerical relativity with the ring down from uh, perturbation theory. Uh, coming from a perturbation theory background, I know that we used in this last part spin weighted spheroid harmonics and yeah. not spheric, spheric harmonics. And I know that in numerical relativity you use spherical harmonics and not spheroidal. There, what is the difference when you compare these two regimes there? There is any difficulty? To, because if the modes are different, the frequencies could be different in, in principle. <laughs> My favorite question. I like this question. So, so, the, so um, let's see. In numerical relativity, which is when you, when you solve the equations, sorry. In, in numerical relativity, when we, we solve the Einstein equations, we don't use any spherical harmonics of any kind, okay? We just solve in whatever in our coordinates, this kind of pseudo-Cartesian coordinates, we solve basically for the metric components. We compute uh, the wave signal, the, the, the quantities which correspond to the wave signal, strain of psi 4, whatever it is, okay? But now, we want to describe the results. In order to describe the results, uh, it's useful to um, describe them in some appropriate basis functions. Because if you choose a good basis, then in this basis expansion, you really just need a few components. Okay? If, uh, I, what, what uh, in any case, you would be familiar from uh, electrodynamics, for example, you, in electrodynamics for the wave description, you can use spherical harmonics. And so you start at the dipole and then the quadrupole and so on. And usually, for most sources, you don't need many of these um, expansion coefficients, and they, they describe your system. Okay? So this is just, in a, in a way, it's a very useful uh, writing the, the result in terms of spherical harmonics. It's a very useful way to compress the information. Okay? In particular, the, the, the dominant quadrupole 
is by far dominant. Maybe just this one function is enough. Maybe you use a few higher multiples, and that is usually what you need for data analysis. All right? Um, now it turns out when, uh, when you do this for the ring down, uh, for some of the modes, you, you can get away from that looks kind of very funny. It looks like different, different modes are mixing together. And the reason for this is that the natural physical description of these perturbations is, in fact, in terms of spheroidal harmonics, which are the appropriate basis functions for to expand. Right, and I, I will say. So, so if, you, if, you have, um, if you have a field, a linear field in, in a black hole background, then there are basically natural basis functions to, ex to expand your linear field, depending what precisely they are, depends on whether you have a scalar field or a tensor field or whatever it is. If it's a tensor field, uh, like the gravitational wave signal, then you use the appropriate um, tensor harmonics. Um, but then, because um, basically the, the, uh, you have to adapt your basis functions to the, the type of black hole that you have. And since the only real parameter of the black hole is the spin, basically the appropriate, the appropriate basis functions that depend on the spin. Okay? Um, you have the standard spherical harmonics are the appropriate harmonics if you have, an, if you have no spin. But then if the black hole is spinning, essentially your basis functions, they get squeezed down. They become kind of oblate. They get deformed with the spin of the black hole. And there's some, you break some degeneracy because if, if you have a non-spinning black hole, it's, it's the same whether you go in this direction or in this direction. But if it's spinning, then it makes a difference whether you go this way around or the other way around. Okay, so for the, for the spheroidal harmonics, which are adapted to spinning black holes, then there will be one frequency which goes this way for the wave which goes around this way, and another frequency for the wave which goes around the other way. Okay? Um, and so, if, so then it turns out for spinning black holes, your signal may look much simpler if you look spheroidal harmonics than if you use spherical harmonics. All right? And so, so this means for, for certain spherical harmonics, that, for example, in particular, this is like the L equals 3, M equals 2, for example, is very strongest. If you use spherical harmonics, you get mode mixing. You get like very complicated uh, features that are hard to model. But if you use spheroidal harmonics, it looks much, much simpler. Okay? Uh, at the moment, there is no... Um, I have to check, actually, I have to check how good, the, how good it comes out in the, uh, uh, in the ROMs, the NR ROMs. I'm not quite sure how well they do that. Not sure. But let's say that they're not doing that so well. <laughs> um, then there's, there's, no, there's no model in the literature which actually gives you um, this mode mixing effect for, let's say, the 3-2 mode. Okay? But whenever we finish our paper, then, then it's going to be. So, so it has been done. So there's a number of, mode of, 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 of uh, wafer models which are currently being upgraded by all the Wolfram modeling groups for the next science run. And so one of the upgrades that we're going to do is to use spherical harmonics, uh, so sorry, spheroidal harmonics, and, and then these mode mixing uh, things are resolved and it, it's under control. So I have a question about the numerical noise. Uh, does it is it constant over time when you make the simulation, or it uh, it gets higher over time? The uh, noise. That's a that's a that's a very good. Oh, um, essentially, essentially, I mean, there, there are all kinds of different sources of numerical noise. Okay, but essentially, 
the main the main um, mechanism is you have your you have your binary going around. This creates gravitational waves which travel outward into the grid, and then they are not perfectly well resolved, and they like you uh, you break the waves. Some of the waves get backscattered. It's it's a similar if you if you if you throw a stone into a pond with a complicated boundary. You know, first you see these waves traveling through the water very smoothly, but then they hit the, the boundary, and then they, and they come back. And so if, if you watch this for a while, you have a very complicated pattern of waves on your, on your lake. Okay? And essentially, there are two big splashes of waves that happen during the evolution, which then create all kinds of reflections and reflections. Okay? Uh, the one big splash is at the end when the, with the merger, is the highest is the highest amplitude. There's a bigger amplitude, and this this big amplitude waves they get out. Ah, and some of these uh, some of the waves they don't because they, you don't have enough resolution. Uh, they they get backscattered. They come back to where the black holes are, and they create noise there. Okay, and for example, they will you will see these signals here at the end. These are waves that they were not properly resolved. They come back. They bounce around in your grid. Okay. And there's, then there's another, a similar source, which is, which is right at the beginning, uh, that I will explain, not sure, tomorrow, tomorrow, Wednesday. When we set up our initial data, the initial data are not entirely physical. Um, they, they contain some unphysical gravitational wave signal. And so, somehow, basically, or you can think of the initial data as the proper physics, plus a little bit of extra radiation, which is not physical, which we call junk radiation. And so this junk radiation, it just leaves the grid in some big pulse initially. And, and the frequency of these junk waves is pretty much the quasi-normal mode frequency of the two individual black holes. Okay? Which, since they are smaller, the frequency is higher, the wavelength is smaller, and so these are the, this is the wave signal which has the poorest resolution. They have the highest frequency and they're poorly resolved. And so that, that creates a lot, of, a lot of noise in the beginning. Okay? So in some sense, but the noise budget of your simulation is, first there's this junk radiation. It's not very well resolved. It creates a lot of noise. It takes maybe 1,000 m or so for this to, to go out of the grid, to be uh, dissipated away. Uh, then you can happily evolve until the merger, but then there's another big chunk another big peak of radiation which doesn't get perfectly resolved, and then this will uh, ruin your, your ring down at the end. This, this is if everything goes well. If things don't go well, then you can have lots of other sources of noise as well. Uh, in particular, because you, you need to do, use mesh refinement, you have different meshes, and if these meshes, they don't come together with, with good enough resolution or with some other artifacts, then you create a lot of extra noise, which is, which is all like, you know, these waves that you just throw a stone in the, in the pool, and it creates very complicated wave patterns which travel around your grid. Does that make sense? When you apply at ADM decomposition, you break the covariant formalism of GR. Mm -hmm. When I choose a, a coordinate system to fit the laps and shift function, uh, when we perform a um, uh, chain of coordinates, how the equation are, are related? I don't know if. So, I mean. I'm not, I'm not completely sure I understand the question. So if, if, you, if, you, uh, if, you, if you perform a change of the coordinate system, then so, so, so computing this, for example, at the initial slice is, is one thing, but of course propagating the change of the coordinates all through your numerical evolution is a bit tricky, but of course in principle you can do it. Yeah. And if you do this, you will find that you know, up to your numerical errors, the, the physical quantities will all agree. But if... I I, I change the, the coordinates. Mm -hmm. The equations 
the form of the equation are the equivalents or ah, oh, by, by well, the this depends. This, well, okay, that's so that it depends on how much you change them. If if um, if you write down your equations in a very in a general um, form, such that one, you know, one is a time coordinate, which means that the t equals constant are space like hypersurfaces and so on, the, the, the equations will look the, I mean, the equations are going to look the same. But for example, if now you, you make your coordinate a null coordinate, well, then they're going to look different. So if you really change the causal character of your coordinates, that makes the equations look different. But, but unless you do this, they, they essentially look the same. Of course, if there's a symmetry, for example, in the space-time, then whether you adapt your coordinates to the symmetry or not, that makes a big difference. And about quasi-normal modes, uh, can be detected by LIGO? Well, it depends on depends on what the signal to noise ratio is. So, so at the moment, at, at the moment, I would say the contribution of the quasi-normal modes to the signal to noise ratio is really, really small. But uh, it depends. Anyway, the, the, now the detectors get upgraded, they're going to be a bit more sensitive. And of course, uh, the more black holes you see the higher is the probability that eventually you see one that is even closer. And so the, the, the maximum signal to noise ratio that you see with time, it goes up. It goes up because the detectors become more sensitive and you have more statistics. So eventually we will see, we, we think we will see the um, quasi-normal modes. When exactly that will be, I don't know. Hopefully soon. J just to add the comment, you you seen in the colloquium last Wednesday the, the plot by uh, of the first event. It basically was something like this. So you, you could see the exponential dumping. Dumping. <laughs> dumping. <It's not> <laughs> the exponential dumping. The point is that if you see just one mode, I mean, you cannot call it a mode, just an exponential dumping. You have to see two modes, the one with decays with one time, the, sec the other one that decays with another time. Mm -hmm. And since you already have an estimate of the mass and the spin, if you measure two modes with their real part of the frequency and their dumping time, then you have four parameters to check with two, and that would be non-trivial. But now, I mean, we have mass and spin and have real part and imaginary part. So, I mean, anything, it's always, you can always measure this. You, you're just trading two parameters for two. But if you measure two modes, that would be a non-trivial measure of the quasi-normal modes. So far, we've seen one dumping, so it's, it's not a measure of quasi-normal mode. But we did see this part of the waveform. It's just that we couldn't check the relationship between mass and spin and uh, in re in complex frequencies of the quasi-normal mode. It's also the, so the, the more events that you have, then you can do some analysis which goes beyond just analyzing one case. Because then in principle you can do some very complicated analysis which takes into account all of the events that you have seen and then you might be able to pull out some information like what, what Ricardo mentioned which it's not very clear in any of the events but if you analyze all of them together then you maybe it gives you some contribution it gives you some information this mic, this microphone is there. Yeah, how, how are you doing with the exercises? So, uh, has, has anybody started with uh, doing any of the exercises or, for example, the, the computer code? Did anybody make a plan of how they're going to approach this problem? So speak here and try sure. again. I think it's... Now it's up. My question is about the uh, Cauchy uh, surface. Uh, what? My question is about the, the Cauchy surface. Uh, you define the Cauchy surface in a, a four-dimensional manifold, right? But uh, can we define a Cauchy surface in a manifold with extra dimensions, as, as for example, the random syndrome models, 
regard regardless the uh, nature of the extra dimension if you have if if it's a if it's a Lorenz, if it's a Lorentzian space time mm -hmm. if it has more dimension it doesn't change the concept of a uh, the concept of a um, domain of dependence and global hyperlicity and the Cauchy surface it doesn't change if you have more dimensions if you have same concept for example if you have two ex uh, uh, one extra dimension of that time like extra dimension uh, Yes, for example, you can def can you define uh, a Cauchy surface? Well, I would have said it doesn't make any sense. Now it, it turns out it turns out we we have this master student and he's fascinated by multiple time dimensions and he has dug out amazing literature and people have actually worked on this with with strange motivation. And, and, and then so there's at least one, one or two papers where the claim is that even with two time dimensions, you can, you can define some initial value problem. I, I'm very happy if somebody has opinions on this. My, my opinion is that, so, you basically then the, 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 the thing is that if you, if you put certain conditions on the initial data, the claim is then that, 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 you, that the um, initial value problem becomes well posed. My opinion is that these conditions on the initial data, they seem to be completely non-physical and too restrictive and it doesn't make any sense. But if you, somebody has a different opinion, I'm very happy to hear it. So I, I would say this doesn't make much sense. But, but people have actually worked on this and, and claimed that it's super interesting. So uh, <laughs> that's all I have to say about it. But there's certainly, once you have two time dimensions, there's not a Lorentzian space time, all kinds of things change. And, and um, you know, you have to you have to work on on what actually you mean and, and so on. But, but but people have worked on this. So a few questions for the astrophysics. Astrophysics is is si simpler than general relativity, apparently. <laughs> yet in the next lectures. Uh, you didn't want you to want, ask You me. want a question from, from me? No, 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 for you. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, what is the role of accretion in the gravitational wave radiation? Uh, Sorry, can you repeat your question? The what is the role of the accretion of the black hole in the gravitational wave radiation? No, well, depends on the system. So as I will develop over the next few days, um, you have three classes of uh, astrophysical black holes. So you have uh, the ones in the centers of galaxies, you have binary systems in our galaxy, and you have a sort of gamma ray bursts, okay? So for the ones in the centers of galaxies, no. The, the thing is that the mass in the accretion disk is very little compared to the mass of the central black hole, usually. So just for that reason, with a dimensional, with a, you know, dimensional uh, no, order of magnitude analysis, it is so few mass in the accretion disk that you don't expect even if it's highly perturbed, there will be very little gravitational waves. However, when you have um, when you have, for instance, neutron star mergers, and you know, and, and the accretion disk mass is comparable to the mass of the new, of the stars because it was produced by the coalescence of the of the neutron stars, then you have interesting things happening. I'm not sure if the from the numeric or the the other lectures will cover this. When you have a massive baryons, not only event horizons, but you have actually coalescence of neutron stars. I'm sure the next week there will be a multi messenger talk. I don't remember who is giving. And also, uh, yeah, there will be a talk by Sylvia Zhu next week. I'm sure she will cover, she told me she will cover the gamma ray bursts 
I will talk a little bit about gamma ray bursts, and she will also cover. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, what, did, what did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So when you say accretion disk of um, massive black hole at the center of the galaxy, so the massive black hole at the center of the galaxy is 10 to the 6 solar masses, and the accretion disk is what? 10 to the 2? 10 to the 1? Mm. You know what? It's uh, I, I haven't done the calculation actually of the accretion disk because it's usually it's just uh, the mass is much, much, much less than the black hole, but I don't have a number to give you for the mass of the accretion disk. It's less, le it's much, much less than the black hole. I don't have a number to give you out of the top of my head. Yeah. Also, another thing uh, uh, I will mention: the Event Horizon Telescope. Okay. The, have you have you heard of the Event Horizon Telescope? There are rumors that we might see the first image of an event horizon in the history, which will be the next breakthrough in observational astronomy, if you call gravitational waves observational astronomy, the shadow of the event horizon. I don't know. <laughs> so so then it's looking at the um, supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy? Yeah, I, I will talk a bit about this in the next few lectures. It's about um, that graph. <laughs> um, so once the, <laughs> the the barrier is already is small enough in height, so the black holes uh, go radially between each other, right? Or not? Or they are still spinning around? Like. So what happens with the motion of the black holes when you don't have the barrier at all? So they... Uh, yeah, uh, you mean like here? In the here? point. Uh -huh, in the southern point. When you pass it? Yeah. Um, so when the angular momentum becomes small enough and the barrier goes away, then basically here you don't have a stable circular orbit anymore, but it's a meta -circular.